He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Our message today is based on our gospel lesson, and I read again verse 6. And he said to them, Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, aside from being Easter, I think everybody knows that today happens to be April 1st, April Fool's Day. So if you look at the title of the sermon, I just had to do it. He is risen, no fooling. But it's also true. Mark isn't trying to fool anyone with his report. He is giving us the sober facts. The ones who are trying to fool you are the false prophets that crop up every year at the time of Easter and tell you that Jesus did not rise physically from the grave alive and well. And maybe it's some sort of spiritual resurrection or his soul rose or some other poppycock like that. Those are the ones who are trying to fool you and it is a deadly trick that can rob us of our salvation. As St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You are no fools. The record is clear. When you have well over 500 eyewitnesses to something, well, that will stand up in any court of law anywhere. Now, we should be clear about what Mark records and what he doesn't record. Mark records an empty tomb in the appearance of an angel. Some feel that the being that Mark is referring to is not an angel, but a man. However, when angels appear, they often take on the appearance of other people, of humans. They do that for our sake, not because they have to. The response of the women make it clear that this was no ordinary young man. We have a lot of ladies in here today. A show of hands of everyone who, when you see a young man, you run screaming. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. But what is the response that these ladies have? They are terrified. That is the standard human response when seeing an angel. That is why their first words is almost invariably something like, do not be afraid, or as in this case, do not be alarmed. Of course, we also have the other Gospels that record this scene, and they tell us point blank that it is an angel. So we have the response of the ladies, and we have the confirmation of the other Gospels to tell us. However, none of the Gospels actually record the resurrection. No person was present to witness it. Those artists that show pictures of Jesus bursting forth from the tomb, knocking down the stone, or knocking out the guard, or whatever, are giving you an idea of what's in their mind, but not actually what's on the pages of the Bible as an eyewitness account. The actual event of the resurrection of Jesus was simply not witnessed by any human eyes. And Mark, as well as the other gospel writers, are interested in recording what was witnessed. And they witnessed an empty tomb and angels. Jesus did appear to his followers following his re resurrection, even though they didn't witness the actual resurrection event. 
Nonetheless, how can you appear to people and talk with them and even eat with them, like Jesus did, if you were still in the grave? It's not a big leap of logic there to figure out what happened. Anyways, uh, they did not have to rely simply on the empty tomb or the word of the angel. And yet we also remember, for those of us who live so many years after the fact, the words that Jesus spoke to Thomas. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we stand with these women on that day who were leaving based only on the word of the report of the angels, or the angels, we stand with them, believing the word that we have received. And Jesus calls us blessed because of that. So, as Mark tells it, and the other Gospels agree, Jesus was buried just before the Sabbath began. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried him in Joseph's tomb, which was in a nearby garden. They wrapped him in a linen shroud that was laced with myrrh and aloes, which would have been dried spices, and laid him on the shelf that was cut in the wall of the tomb. The job was naturally a rushed job. They had to get it done before sundown. Some of the ladies witnessed all of this, and they couldn't help but notice that the job was the bare minimum required. He had not been anointed with oils and that sort of stuff. And they wanted to do a better job, a proper job. And it was a way for them to show their devotion to Jesus. It's just that they didn't have time. Joseph and Nicodemus, they barely got the job done. And then the next day, the Sabbath, no work could be done. So once it was sunset on Saturday, the Sabbath was over, the ladies hustled out to the stores, bought the various ointments and what all that they needed, stayed up mixing them properly, and then early Sunday morning, they started off. And when they got to the tomb, it was about sunrise. As they neared that tomb, as I said, the sun was rising, and it just seemed fitting to me. At the moment when darkness is giving way to light, the ladies were approaching the site where a new day for all humanity was dawning. As they grew nearer, they realized they had brought no one to roll the stone away. As the deal between the Jewish leadership and Pilate to put a Roman guard at the tomb was not general knowledge, the ladies would not have been depending on the pity of those guards to roll the stone away. Who would move the stone? The answer is God. Okay, an angel, but the angel was acting on the words and orders of God, so by extension, God. Just like when my sister came out and yelled, dinner time, I knew it was really my mom yelling dinner time, and I came in. <laughs> the size of the stone is noted, which emphasizes the burst of power that it would have been needed to blow the stone out of the track. These stones were large discs set in a track so that it could be rolled in front of the tomb opening, which was cut in the side of a cliff. When the ladies got there, it had been thrust out of its track and down on its side flat. This was not done by Jesus. It was not done to let Jesus out. He was already gone. It was done so that the disciples and the ladies could go in and see that he was gone. So, for example, in John 20, and Jesus can do this because 
He is capable of doing things with his physical body that you and I cannot do. In John 20, the disciples are in a locked room when Jesus appears to them live and well physically. He did not need to open the door. He did not need to sneak in through a window. He is simply able to enter physically. As I said, he can do things with his body that we just can't. So he exited his grave shroud and the tomb simply by physically passing through them without losing his physicalness. That's why in John's gospel, you see reported that the grave cloths just collapsed down. I can't do that. You can't do that. Jesus can do that. In the same way he's able to be with us physically, in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, just because we can't do it, like I said, doesn't mean that Jesus can't do it. The angel at the tomb interprets to the woman, women the, the fact of the empty tomb. The words of the angels are, in a nutshell, the core gospel message that the church proclaims to this day. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. We also confess Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus who was born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus who was true man as well as true God. We also confess that he was crucified and died. In fact, it's right there in the creeds, isn't it? The angel goes on to say he has risen. He is not here. We still confess that he has risen just as he said he would. Go to the tomb. It is still there today. I'm curious. How many people have been uh, to uh, Jerusalem? Anybody? Nobody? My goodness. I would like to go one of these days. And when I go, this is one of the things I'm going to do. I'm going to go to that tomb because it's still there today. And I'm going to look in there just like the disciples did. And you know what? I'm going to see the same thing they did. An empty tomb. Because it is still empty today. The ladies are told to go tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. We still have that great commission to go and tell. Now Mark doesn't actually record the Galilee event. If you want to see the Galilee event, you have to go, go to Matthew because he has it. That is where Jesus gives us the Great Commission. The Church of Christ, though, has been going and telling ever since. Now, many have wondered about verse 8, the last verse that we read. Mark leaves off with the women trembling, astonished, and afraid. Mark even tells us something that's really kind of jarring when you think about it. He says that they told nobody anything. But then you have to ask yourself, how is it that Mark's able to write this if they didn't tell anybody anything? Clearly they talked. Okay. So what are we supposed to understand from Mark's words? First off, the women... We're not the only ones who are afraid, right? We have record in the gospel account that the men were afraid too. And because they were afraid, it seems unlikely that they were all gathered together in one place waiting for the Sanhedrin or Roman guards to come and arrest them. They dispersed in all probability. So the fact that the women told no one could be in part simply because they could find no one. They were in hiding. And they weren't just going to blab it around to anybody. They weren't going to go to the Sanhedrin and report it. They weren't going to go to who knows who, you know, the Roman guard and report it. So they were going to be telling the disciples. That's who they were told to tell. Finally, we learn from John's gospel that Mary Magdalene did find Peter and John. Not all 10, 12, or 11 yet, 
you know, but these two, and they raced to the tomb and found it empty, but there were no angels there. We also learn from Matthew's gospel that Jesus appeared to the ladies while they were returning to town, giving them the courage that they needed. In Luke, we have the story of the Emmaus Road disciples who report that the ladies finally did find the larger group of disciples and they told their tale and they were generally not believed. You know how women are, right? They're prone to fancy. <laughs> That's what the disciples thought anyway. You know, yeah, yeah, you saw an angel, you know. But uh, then Jesus had to appear to them. And you ladies ought to like this because Jesus gives the disciples, the men, a hard time for not believing the women. <laughs> <laughs> that evening Jesus appeared to 10 of the 11 remaining disciples and set the record straight. So yes, the ladies were trembling. Yes, they were filled with astonishment. Yes, they were afraid. And yes, at first, they told nobody, probably because they were having a hard time finding the people they were supposed to talk to. But they did talk. Like I said, how do you think Mark found out about this? It's not like Mark was a mind reader. Okay. These are the facts. They are confirmed by the other gospel accounts. They are confirmed by St. Paul in our epistle reading for today. But the facts only take us so far. What do these facts mean? You have to have the facts. Our faith is built on historical events, historical facts, historical realities. But these facts also have a meaning. And if our epistle lesson had gone on just a little bit further, St. Paul would have given us the meaning. He wrote, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Remember, I've been accenting that this is all facts, right? In fact, he has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Jesus' resurrection means that those who die in the Christian faith will be raised on the last day. Body and soul, perfect to live eternally. Jesus' resurrection means that he has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. Jesus' resurrection means he is coming back physically. Jesus' resurrection means he has all authority and power, and all merely human authority and power is subject to him. Jesus' resurrection means that all of humanity's ultimate enemies, sin, and even death have no future. Jesus' resurrection means that you, as believers in Christ, have a bright and glorious future. That is what the resurrection means. So don't let anyone fool you, neither today nor at any other time in the year. Jesus has risen just as he promised. We have the sober witness of those who stood in the presence of the empty tomb, of those who stood in the presence of the resurrected Christ. And like those women who departed the tomb with the word delivered to them by the angel, so we depart and share the gospel based on the word that we have received.
the word of the eyewitnesses. So we join with all believers from all ages and say, Hallelujah, he has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.